unforeseen events can have a huge impact on both our lives and our finances. And so now more than ever, benevolent charities like this one are really in the spotlight and feel both highly relevant and also much needed. My name is Josh Breckenfeld, and I'm currently the Director of Global Corporate Development at Aspen, and I previously worked at Lloyd's of London as a Business Oversight Manager. But today, I'm really proud to sit here as a trustee and a board member of the Insurance Charities, which is the only charity in the UK and Ireland solely supporting those in the insurance sector. And over the next hour, we'll introduce you to the charity, explain who we are and how we can help, and highlight the support we can offer to you and your employees. And we're also really pleased that this webinar can be uh, included as part of your CPD requirements for up to an hour. So if you consider it relevant to your professional development needs, please, uh, please do so. And by attending this session, we hope to meet the following learning objectives. The first one is to have a better awareness of the insurance charities and support that it can give to the sector and the wider insurance community. The second is to understand, to guide change in your firm's cultural behaviors and build good corporate relationships and citizenship. And finally, we'll give you the knowledge and access and access the um, eligibility criteria so that you can recognize and support those in need, either in your own organization or closer to home. And as I said, on today's webinar, we've asked everybody to be automatically muted so that, um, so that we can all hear the speakers crystal clear. But if you would like to ask a question, you can do so in the chat area at the bottom of your screen. We will answer these at the end of the webinar if time allows, and if not, we'll find out another mechanism to maybe email them out so that you still get those answers if we don't cover them today. And finally, for any colleagues not able to join us today, the session is being recorded and will be made available afterwards. So that's it for the ground rules in my introduction. I'm really now pleased to introduce two key people from the insurance charities. Firstly, a fellow board member and trustee, Adriana O'Sullivan. Adriana, who is based in Ireland, has been involved with the charity for almost 15 years now. And she's currently the Chief Executive Officer at Arag Legal Protection. And prior to that, she was Chief Executive for Ireland at DAS UK. And secondly, I'd really like to give a warm welcome to Joy Thornacroft. And she's our Chief Executive and Secretary for the Insurance Charities. If I could also just remind folks, if you are joining the webinar today, please do keep yourselves on mute, and that way we can keep the background noise to a minimum. So with that brief introduction, Joy, can I start with you? Can you hear me okay? I can, thank you, Josh, yeah, perfect. Oh, good, good to see you. <laughs> you know, Joy, you've been involved in this charity for over 30 years, and as a board member, you know, it's been my real honor to work with the group for, for over a year now, and I'm constantly amazed by the background and the story and the legacy that the charity has. Could you walk us through a little bit of how long we've been around and why it's the insurance charities well, yes, as opposed absolutely. to insurance charity? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Josh. And it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much to everybody who's, who's joined. Um, we really hope this will be an interesting session for you. And it may even just spark something in your mind, which means actually you can bring somebody to us who we should be helping. So the insurance charities has a long history, but not actually in its current name. Um, the insurance orphanage, as it was, was established in 1902 and then subsequently became the Insurance Orphans Fund. In 1926, the Insurance Benevolent Fund was created so that the two charities sat alongside each other to serve the insurance industry. They coexisted until 2003 when the Insurance Charities was named and in 2004 they formally came together. The name of the insurance charities was deliberately chosen so that we could be well placed to serve the industry. And in fact, over the years, we've actually taken on board a number of other charities who were serving pockets of the industry. But now we can work together and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great honour to head up this organisation and, uh, and to be working with uh, people like yourself, Josh, and also the industry so that we can really meet the needs of those people who serve us so well. I think that's a really good synopsis of, of sort of how the charity came about. And, and Adriana, I hope I can turn to you. Can you, you know, we often on the board talk about the type of folks that, that we hear from. Can you explain to us exactly who can apply for help and whether they need to be currently working in insurance at the time of application? Yes, good morning, Josh. Good morning, everybody. Greetings from Dublin. 
Anybody who works or has worked in the insurance sector in Ireland or the UK, including the Channel Islands, can apply to the insurance charities for help. Uh, essentially, anyone who has chosen insurance as their career. We provide one-off or and or ongoing support, both practical and financial. And we talk a little bit about the practical um, as, as we go on this morning. Um, and we also provide charitable loans where necessary. And yes, we are here to offer support to dependents too. And, and when we talk about that type of support, I mean, I'm, it's heartbreaking some of these instances. Can you, can, you give, can you give us some context in terms of what type of, what type of situations we help folks with that come to the charities? Yes, certainly, Josh. You know, the reality of life is that we just don't know what curved balls will be thrown at us tomorrow. Sudden illness, marriage breakup, the birth of a special needs child. They all put huge financial as well as other strains on a household. For example, in the past year, we've been able to help by providing assistance for property adaptations, you know, following incapacity after an illness or indeed an accident, for mobility vehicles, wheelchairs, scooters and bikes, education grants, family holidays, counselling and rehabilitation, and the piece I really like are summer and Christmas hampers. So a huge a scenario of what we can do in, in Berlin and right? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's incredible. And Joy, we're always amazed at how the charity works to meet the need of every single case in that very bespoke, hands-on way. I wonder if you could explain the type of support um, that people can apply for. I mean, is, are we just talking about money here? Surely not. No, not at all. I, I think we all recognise that money alone does not often solve an issue. Sometimes it's a, it's a, it goes a long way to doing that, but um, often people need a helping hand alongside any financial support that we can give. So what we're looking at doing really is, is meeting the needs as they're presented to us. So it could be, for example, that somebody comes with a one-off need, and in those circumstances, a financial gift might be all that's required. But sometimes those one-off requests actually identify that there are problems much deeper and much wider. And then what we try to do is to unpack that with the help of those who come alongside by way of being a volunteer visitor, um, just to find out what it is that's sitting underneath and what we could really be doing for them. So as I said, it could be a one-off need, but that one-off need actually also might identify an ongoing need. It could be that, um, in a household there is a lower income than they used to be or they could be increased expenditure compared to what it used to be and in those circumstances as well as the one-off need we might be able to provide that ongoing help um, also uh, you might sort of be wondering the type of ways in which we help well we can help basically on a on an outright basis or if loans are appropriate we can give those too um, those might be very short-term loans. Somebody might have a shortfall in income for a very specific period of time and they know that things are going to get better. In those circumstances, we can offer to plug that gap and then people, when they're feeling better and their, their circumstances allow, they might want to repay that. Otherwise, um, most of our help is on an outright basis and if we make a loan, it wouldn't normally come back to us until the person, for example, um, no longer needs the house they're living in or their circumstances have changed so dramatically that they are free then to repay the money to us. Help might be, for example, Josh, also towards things that uh, the NHS can't provide. Um, certain therapies just aren't available to certain people. Uh, and we can understand that. We can't, you know, the, government, the country can't do everything, but there may be a real need. And um, we have been able to help with that. And I'm sure we're going to talk about that a little bit further on. Yes, I mean, I'm always struck at how the charity works so diligently, you know, to the cases that we receive to make sure that the help matches the actual need. Um, it's, I think it's, it's something that is really extraordinary and unique. Speaking of um, help that the charity provides, I really, it's, it's really my great pleasure to now introduce one of our beneficiaries, Amy Green, to tell us about her experience with the charity. Amy, are you with us? Hi, morning, Josh. How are you? Hi, I'm really well. How are you? Good, thank you. Well, 
I hope we can just cover some bases really quickly, if you don't mind. Can you, can you first tell us, I mean, I think there's a context clue here, but uh, where do you currently work and what's your role? <laughs> this is my current office at the moment, uh, my webinar room. I work for Gallicus at the moment. I'm an insurance specialist. I design insurance programs and work directly with clients. Fantastic. And when, when did you first get in touch with the insurance charities? Um, I just had my son, so it was a little over eight years ago. And can you tell us a little bit about the circumstances that surrounded that and, and why did you get in touch with the charities? Yeah, I, I mean, after I'd had my second child, I had, I'd, I had always had hearing loss. I've always been partial hearing. Um, but through my pregnancy and illness, I lost a further level of my hearing. So I'm completely deaf on my right hand side. And, you know, I expected to be able to go to my doctors and the NHS and, and get the hearing aid that I needed to, to get me back to work. But was surprised to learn that my type of hearing loss and the hearing aid required wasn't available on the NHS and that it would have to be privately funded. Quite a difficult time because you planned for maternity leave and the costs involved in it. And I was ready and prepared for that but the unexpected cost of such a technical piece of medical equipment was quite a surprise. And did you did you have any reservations about contacting the charity? Was... I actually didn't know about the charity until I, I opened up to a colleague and they, they explained that you existed and that I could apply for support. Yeah I mean that awareness piece is really what, what brings us all together today yeah. and and, and when you did finally contact the insurance charities, what was that experience like? How did, the, how did the charities help you? I think the process is much simpler than anyone would, to, would believe it would be. You know, I made an application online. Uh, I was fortunate enough to provide some ancillary information and I spoke to the team on the phone and I was really lucky to have Joy come out and visit me as well. And what was that timing like between when you when you put in for that application and then when you and Joy were able to connect? It was so swift. It was within a matter of weeks. So I'd went from this burden of, you know, wondering how I was going to manage to get back to work and, and how I was going to communicate effectively in a role that's really essential to be able to communicate um, to really feeling like I'd had a burden lifted from me. And obviously your experience was was as an employee reaching out to the insurance charities. I wonder if you've given some thought to why you think it's important for employers to get in touch with the insurance charities and to engage with us. Yeah, I never stop talking to HR professionals and insurance about the absolute um, benefits of knowing and keeping in touch with the insurance charities. It's, it's really like having another tool in your in your toolkit really much like the funding that's gone through for the domestic violence toolkit that's available to all employers this is something else that as an hr professional you'd have in your arsenal and be able to reach to because as employers you can't do everything sometimes as much as you would like to yeah. and and you know, we, we're really fortunate today. We've got quite a few people on this webinar. The first one that the insurance charity has ever done that I'm aware of. If, if you could sit down and have a cup of coffee with each of those individuals, what would you tell them? What would your advice be? I think I'd say, you know, just learn as much as you can. Don't be afraid to recommend the insurance charities. Uh, one of the things that I was concerned about when I made my application was that you know, we weren't sort of homeless or on the street or anything. We were a family. We had our own home. We were managing. We just started in our careers. Um, but with a period of maternity leave, it just was going to cause a hardship to buy a hearing aid that costs as much as a brand new car. So I think a lot of people are afraid to recommend, thinking that you have to be in, you know, absolute poverty and hardship. We, there are circumstances where we help people like that but it's where the experience would lend hardship to you. And I think that's what you need to think about if you're a professional thinking about how you can help your colleagues and raise awareness. Yeah, that is, that's such a powerful message, isn't it? Just, you know, if it, pre if it creates a hardship, you know, that is worth enough getting in touch. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that. Thank you for thank that. Thank you. Uh, 
Joy, we just we just heard about Amy's experience and, and how she came in contact with the charity. I wonder, and, and certainly even gave us uh, two thumbs up on the application process. I wonder, can we talk to you briefly about what that application process looks like? Um, what you know, what are the sort of time scales? What can folks expect? And, and do they need to talk to their employers before making an application? Absolutely not. Um, we always say that there is a real value in that partnership if you can have it with your employer, being fully aware of your circumstances, because after all, you're working for them, they can help with adjustments. Um, but we recognise that that conversation isn't one that everybody can have with their HR department. Uh, so an application can come via a company. It also can come from the individual themselves. I guess the um, probably the saddest thing I have in my job is when people come from something like the CAB because they didn't know there was an insurance charities. Now, to me, that's heartbreaking, having been involved for so long, um, you know, and for people not to know when they've either worked in the industry or are working in the industry that there's a charity they could come to and have to get to the point where we all know how hard pressed the CABs are, but, you know, to have actually had to go to somebody else to be referred back into the industry. Uh, but however, we're happy to accept applications from wherever, and if they come from the CAB, so be it. But you know, one of our real focuses is making sure that people know now, when they're working in the industry, about help that could be available for them and their families. So the application can come either by, by the website, from the HR person, or, or from, from another referring organisation. Uh, what we do once they apply to us is to make sure, first of all, they're eligible. So they need to be eligible in terms of insurance service. We don't normally put a day, a number of years on it because what we're looking for, as Adrienne said earlier on, is people who've committed to the insurance industry as a career. Now that career could be 30 years, but that career could be two years. You know, after two years, something dreadful could happen, which would mean that your career isn't gonna progress as you had hoped. So we're looking for people who've said, yes, I'm, I'm committing to the insurance industry. And as far as I can see, that's where I'm gonna be working. Um, so we're looking for, that uh, confirmation that they've been in the insurance industry. We're then looking really at their finances. And I know this is a touchy subject, but as a charity, we do need to demonstrate that we're helping those who are in need. Um, and it might be that when people come to us, they're not at that point, but it might be further down the line, they will be at that point. And so it's a reassurance we give. So we look at a household's income and expenditure position and their capital. We don't apply guidelines which are you know, as tight as the Department of Work and Pensions, but we do have to have some gu guidelines to assess uh, their need for our help. And then we look at why they're coming to us. Um, it may be that some people come to us because they're not particularly good at managing their finances. It wouldn't then necessarily be us to sort out by just giving them everything they've asked for, but we could offer, we could, we'd offer practical help in looking at budgeting and looking at areas where perhaps people could make economies. But if, for example, they're coming to us and we can really see that there's been a reason why the hardship has existed. As Amy said, uh, a one-off large item of expenditure, which most of us wouldn't be able to budget for, um, or some reason why your income has gone down through a marital breakdown or partnership breakdown, um, or your, inc or your income or expenditure has gone up uh, because you're now having to fund things which you didn't imagine you would have to. So that's why we're looking at that as well. So once we've established that they're eligible in all those three terms, and it sounded a bit more complicated than it really is, but it's not, um, we would then arrange to obtain the information we need. Now, normally, we'd like one of our friendly volunteer visitors to go and see them, but for the past few months, that hasn't been uh, possible, and it probably won't be for the next couple of months either. So we're arranging video calls to talk to people, and then getting them to send in independent confirmation, which could be, for example, something which shows their insurance service with a, a, a start date and a, and a current um, payslip. Um, also something perhaps if they've got a medical condition, we can get something from their medical advisors. Um, and then just confirming their financial position. We can all think of ways in which we can independently get details of those. Uh, and then, as I said, just to establish they are who they say what they are, because after all, we do have to be, be careful. Uh, we would we're now starting up videoing calls, um, which uh, is new to us, but uh, it's, it's, it's working fine. And the application, as, as Amy said, you know, can be quite quick. If we get everything we need, we can, do, we can turn around an application in a matter of days. And, uh, but we want, to make, we want to get it right. You know, we want to make sure that we're really understanding what the problem is, what the issues are, uh, and, and meeting those.
Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's interesting. What we do, as you say, you know, we do take care to make sure that we understand um, what's in front of us in the fullest, completest part, picture. We try to do that in a way, if I understand you correctly, that is um, as simple and as seamless and as um, compassionate as possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, yeah. we, we're, although we're the insurance industry and I know we haven't always got the best name, I think actually those who really work in the industry have got a heart for helping people. That's the whole essence of insurance, isn't it? Sharing, sharing out, uh, you know, that, that, that risk or whatever. So in the same way that our industry had its roots and, and often the people that are working in it, you know, have that real heart for people, seeing them through difficult times. Um, we pride ourselves on that as well. That is vitally important to us. And, and I think, Joy, it's, it's worth noting here. I mean, we talk about how we put together um, a relief package as it relates to the case that's in front of us. How do we take into account maybe state benefits or redundancy packages, other things that could be coming to the individual as well? Um, you know, it's a good point because as a charity, as I mentioned before, we do have to make sure that we are supplementing what is available generally as well as specifically. So it could be, for example, that there are benefits available generally and we need to help people know they're there and apply for them. And it may be after they have those benefits, they don't need our help. And so it would be wrong for us to replace that. But after they get the help, they still might need our help. <laughs> so we would then uh, work with them after that as well. And the same way with an employer, we see ourselves very much as, as Amy said, you know, wanting to work in partnership. Um, so once the employer has done what they feel is reasonable and what they can, it still may mean there's a need for something more because we understand every employer cannot meet every particular need of every employee. And it's entirely right that there should be this, this net to catch those who otherwise might fall. Well, in your answer there, you, you used one of the buzzwords, which is something that we really tried to focus on, and that is creating partnerships, right? So that it's not just the insurance charities, you know, providing support, but that we're widening the net to work with other charitable organizations to really deliver something impactful. I wonder if you wouldn't mind taking just a few minutes and maybe highlighting a few of the partnerships that we have uh, and that we're currently working on. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be pleased to. Um, it's not, a, it's not a, a full list, it's a, it's a little overview really. But what we try to do is to identify those, um, those issues that are faced by probably the majority of people coming to us and then categorize those and see who we could be working with. Um, and the very first significant partnership we did uh, was, uh, it was called Friends in Need. It was with Depression Alliance. Um, the clues in the name, I guess, working with people who, um, who have depression as, 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 part of their, as part of their life. And uh, we were really honoured to be able to enable a, a community, a micro community to be built so that those with depression could connect with other people who shared their interests, first of all. So if you and I, Josh, for example, like knitting, you know, we'd get together and share knitting patterns and tips because we like knitting. The fact we both have depression was a secondary thing. But if then I saw perhaps that you weren't communicating so much or whatever, I'd be able to reach out to you because we shared an interest, not because we were both sharing depression. And in that way, you know, we found an incredible number of people built up communities around them um, to support each other. And, and, you know, part of the cycle is being able to support somebody else. And, and, it, and it worked so well. We had over 75,000 people signed up. Um, at the time that it was then taken into mind and is now being developed into something which is on a different platform, as you'll understand. These things, uh, when they're online, they have to be reasonably regularly updated to make sure the security is there for everybody involved. I mean, that was just such a boost for us, being, being in the right place at the right time. They needed our money, we had, we had the money to give, and we were able to launch that, first of all, into the insurance industry. But then for those people in the insurance industry also to create other networks outside the insurance industry based on that. So that's the first one. I know you said be brief. I'm trying to be. We also have a partnership with Shelter because we recognize that um, people who come to us, whether they live in rented or owned properties, at times come up against some quite significant housing issues. And we are a very small office and whilst we try to, to be up to date on everything, uh, it's physically impossible. So we buy in from shelter expert advice. Uh, we can refer those who come to us 
to um, an advisor who can tell them everything they need about their position, their rights, uh, and, and support them through it. And I mean, that is such a great tool for us to have. Um, it means that we can, with confidence, refer people to those who've got um, the information at their fingertips and it's up to date and it's relevant. Um, we also have a very exciting partnership with the Alzheimer's Society, which is of course very on trend at the moment for the insurance industry. Uh, it means that we can refer people to a specialist advisor um, if they're in the insurance industry or they have a member of their family who has um, Alzheimer's or, or dementia, they can come to us and we will put them in touch with somebody who will telephone them and before the lockdown, visit them. Um, they can tell them about everything that's in their area. They can tell them about, listen to them, you know, which sometimes it's just people want to be listened to and have, you know, some, some talking through of where they're at. Uh, so that's the one arm of this, which is the um, fast track to a specialist advisor, dedicated advisor for you. And the second arm of it is the volunteering program, which has obviously come to a little bit of a, a, a stop at the moment, but we're raring to open it up again um, once we can all, all get it out there again. Um, and it gives insurance people the opportunity to volunteer in whatever way they can they can fit into their lives, whether it's on the telephone or whether it's physically in person, helping somebody who has dementia, perhaps access um, something which otherwise would be tricky for them to do. And that, for example, could be going to the library. It could be um, going to a football match. It could be a number of things, you know, just providing that practical support or a te regular telephone line help, um, things which, uh, you know, we're really proud that we've started on this partnership and um, there are others too uh, we'll just quickly talk about the employers initiative on domestic abuse because I know you want me to talk about that yes, and Amy has Amy has touched on it uh, you know sadly we know um, that domestic abuse is a big stain on our society um, and that people who perhaps we look at and cannot imagine that they would be in that difficult home situation are. And those who come to us, Josh, um, often have walked away from everything. They literally have nothing. They're prepared to give up everything in order to get out. And we know that when they've done that, they've obviously had that situation for a long time in their lives. And so they know that in time, things will probably be okay for them financially, but at the time they walk away, they've walked away from their money, their possessions, their share of a property, everything. And they need somebody to get them into somewhere where they can start again. Now, we can't do very much about the scars, the ongoing um, issues they have to deal with, and often the ongoing contact that they have to go through. But we can sometimes help them set up an accommodation which is suitable for them and their children if they have that, um, as well as help them perhaps with therapy uh, and a number of things which might just start to give them a future. Uh, so as, I, as we mentioned before, it could just be a particular point in someone's life when things go wrong. Um, and if they don't get timely help at that point, things can go even worse. And, uh, you know, th that's what we're trying to do, really, to help with that. And so uh, as well as the people that we help individually, we, find, we funded the toolkit for employers so that they can help identify and support those people who, A, are victims of domestic abuse and also those who are perpetrators. And I know that that's hard for some people to think that the the handbook will try and help those but if we do not root the problem out and help those who are the abusers we will always have the abused so we, we wanted to try and uh, help on both sides and um, we've made a start and we're proud of that well and it's it's incredible the really well-known charities and, and partnerships that that we've established and it just it just speaks to the breadth of services that we can that we can offer and the alliances that we can make and um, and, the, and the different folks that, that we can help through some really, really tough times. And thank you for taking us through that. Adrian, I, we talked a little bit about, you know, funding and, 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 you know, making sure that through some of these partnerships, we do help with the funding. Can I come to you and, I mean, let's get to brass tacks. How is the charity funded? Um, and can you explain round about, about how much awards we make on an annual basis so that folks have some idea of the scope? 
Yeah, absolutely. And I should probably say, Josh, um, that the partnerships, the excellent partnerships we have in the UK, we are building on them for the Irish market, for my Irish friends out there. Um, and we are talking to people about um, depression, alliances, autism and the effects of stroke. So just putting that to one side uh, for the moment. Um, Thank you. you asked about um, how, how we're funded. Um, yes, please. We're, we're funded by dividends in our investments. Uh, some very good decisions over very many years. We also were lucky to have some corporate and individual donations and fundraising by the insurance industry. And this is probably a really good time to give a shout out to the insurance institutes across the UK and Ireland uh, who hold many events to benefit us. And um, they have uh, particular uh, charity lunches and also always at their annual dinners, they give, they, they note of us and if they make a collection, it's usually for the insurance charities. So we're very, very grateful. And we'll always appear if they'd like us to do so. In terms of the award, uh, you may be surprised because I know lots of people I talk to are very surprised to learn that in the last five years, we have awarded an average of 1.2 million pounds um, on average. But in the last year, the year uh, 2019 to the beginning of 2020, We've made 959 awards, totaling 1.73 million pounds. I mean, that is, when you look at the numbers like that and the scale of it, it's so impactful. And, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, I've been involved in the charity for just over a year now. And um, I wonder if, have we noticed a change in the profile of the people who have come to us over the years? Are we seeing a pattern shift? And certainly with what we're all currently going through, um, I wonder if you could give some insight on that. Yeah, absolutely, Josh. You know, it's, it's an interesting observation that over the last number of years, yes, the profile has changed. And almost 50% of our help goes towards alleviating hardship. That's helping with day-to-day -day living. Hard to believe for people who work in the insurance world, but that's a fact. And 33% of those we help are aged between 41 and 60 when you would think that life has settled for most of us and we would have settled into a, a, a happier life. But um, they're, that's, they're, they're the observations for recently. Yeah, and I mean, there's some important points in that, right? You know, getting back to what Amy says, you know, you don't have to be, you know, at the end of your career in, in severe hardship to come to the charity and actually receive good help. It's happening to folks at all points uh, in their career and, and that we're able to help. Um, Joy, I wonder, you know, we've often talked about as we see the applications come in, um, you know, in terms of what we've seen an uptick in trends on, around the type of help that we're looking for. Can you talk a little bit about the trends that you're seeing, the type of trends that we're seeing at the board? Um, maybe give some discussion, some thoughts to that. Yeah, I'll have to. Um, uh, as you can probably see or uh, will be aware, I've been with the charity for ages ages and ages and uh, when I first joined most of the cases that we looked at were widows whose retired husbands had elected not to provide a pension for them in retirement. I, I would say probably out of the cases we had 90% would have been in that bracket um, and over the years the, the profile has changed dramatically as Adrian said. Um, you know, far, far more cases now are from those of working age, perhaps those who are intending to continue working, but who have an issue which either might stop them working or is making it much more difficult for them to continue working. So that could be, um, it could be a child who actually needs more of their attention than you could give to somebody else if you had a child who didn't have special needs. So uh, for those of us who, who have had children, um, in our career planning, we may well have seen that, you know, once we get to a certain time, we're happy for them to go to a childminder uh, or a nursery, etc. If you have a child who has multiple um, hospital appointments, um, health concerns which are ongoing, actually those options reduce significantly. And, and as well as the increased costs, of you having to attend appointments uh, and purchase equipment, etc., your income expectation is pulled back. So whereas you had hoped to, to move back and correct, progress in your career, actually that isn't necessarily the path you can take anymore. And I think um, 
you know, those, those, those circumstances, reduced income, increased expenditure, can suddenly blow a family's uh, budget out of the window. Um, other things that we've talked about, you know, what we, what we like to see as a bump in the road, but, you know, rather than a major event, if we can help people over the bump rather than it becomes something which actually falls in on itself. Uh, so something goes wrong and then a, then a relationship breaks down and then a mental health issue develops. Uh, you know, if we can get involved at an early stage where actually it's a financial concern in the main, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're hopefully heading off some of those situations which would have much longer uh, term impact on, a, on an individual and their family. So yes, I would say a reduction in the, in the age of the, the person coming to us. Um, I would say also that real desire for people to keep working, but they need support. It might be they need uh, help with some kind of mobility vehicle to get them to work. Uh, the employer may well do something when they're in their office, but actually getting to work, we've helped with them. Um, uh, costs of getting to work where it's not easy for someone just to jump on the bus or just to jump on the train. Um, we've also seen, I think that, uh, you know, that there, there has been, there has been a big breakdown in the family unit. And um, so we have more and more families living apart with all the additional costs that there are of that. Uh, also second families, sometimes third families, which mean that uh, people who are perhaps re approaching retirement actually aren't approaching retirement where it's OGN said things are getting easier actually there's there's still a lot of, uh, of commitments to finance there and of course if you add in um, poor health or, or a loss of a job um, we're, we're obviously looking at a very unique situation at the moment where most of us don't really know what's going to happen but I think a lot of us think there are going to be quite a lot of casualties you know if we turn the clock back even six months there would be people who thought they were sitting okay may now be thinking things could be very difficult for me if if my job goes and i'm in an industry where it's uncertain for any period of time i i can't just apply for another job uh, so you know all those things um are circumstances which we're looking at now which 30 odd years ago definitely would be in the minority of cases yeah yeah no it's it's incredible. And I think one of the things that you highlighted there that we often talk about is, you know, we don't just triage something, right? We don't just set somebody upright and then put them out the door. We're actually looking to make sure that, that we're trying to, if we can, prevent the major knock that may come just next. So it's really being thoughtful in how we're addressing cases and working with people so that we're not just, you know, we're not just looking at the myopic thing that we are trying to take the, the larger picture into account and, and, and address the larger issue where we can. Right. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I've, I've really enjoyed it up until this point. But there's always things that come up when we interact with people in and around the industry. Um, and what I'm hoping to do now is switch it up ever so slightly and enter into something I like to call Mythbusters. So we often hear uh, anecdotally and folks coming straight up to us, asking us questions and, uh, you know, having an understanding of certain things. And we often have to just set the record slightly straight. So Joy and Adriana, can I ask you to please put your fingers on the buzzers as I enter the Mythbusters round? So, first one, and we hear this a lot. Do you need to be a member of a professional body, such as the CII or the CILA, to apply for help? Adriana, I saw you first. Uh, would you like to answer that one? Oh, certainly, yes. We are an independent charity. And applicants absolutely do not need to be members of the III, the CII, or any other insurance related body or association. Fantastic. Fingers back on the buzzer. So let's say I've retired or I'm currently not working, but I have worked in the insurance industry. Can I apply then? Oh, Joy, that was pretty quick. What's your answer? Well, hopefully I did cover that a little bit earlier on, but just to, to reiterate it, you know, for those who've committed to the industry, whether or not they're still in the industry, uh, we are the insurance charities and we definitely would want them to come to us. Yeah. So this is almost a follow on question, but I'm going to take it back to the buzzers. But let's say for the cynics out there, I've only been working in the industry for a very short while and I've just started out in my career. Would I be able to wait, would I have to wait a certain amount of time before I could contact the charity? Joy, that's back to you. <laughs> I thought it might be. Uh, well, the, the same applies, you know, we, 
we definitely are looking to count people in rather than find ways to exclude them. And um, you know, hopefully, who who people who've applied to us will will understand the reason why we ask questions, etc. But because our funding comes from the insurance industry, uh, we're looking to help insurance people. But if they've only been in the industry for a very short period of time and something happens, absolutely, we would want that to be there for them as we would for somebody who spent 35 years in the insurance industry. And this, this is our last uh, Mythbusters uh, question, so it's worth double points. And we have slightly touched on this earlier, but I figure I should raise it again just because we get asked all the time about it. So, a lot of people might be worried or embarrassed about contacting us for help. Do their employers need to know about the request in order for us to speak out to them? Uh, Adriana, please. Yeah, Josh, you know, we're all sort of, we're all quite proud people and we don't like really asking for help. But by way of comfort, all applications to the insurance charities are treated in the strictest of confidence. And particularly for us in Ireland, we, we live in small communities, some of us, um, and we would be hugely conscious even of the volunteers or the visitor we might send to a potential beneficiary. So applications in the strictest of, com of confidence and absolutely, unless you want us to, your employer will not know about it. And I know those were our Mythbusters, but hopefully there are some other questions that will come from the audience that uh, in just a few minutes we'll be able be able to turn to. A couple of quick points before we do that. Obviously, we know that COVID nineteen has a real impact on people's jobs and household incomes, and I expect these felt. I expect that these effects will be felt for a while yet. Joy, is there any specific support we're offering people over this difficult period? Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, it's, it's an incredibly timely um, webinar, this, and a timely question, because uh, just last week, um, we launched a fund which uh, is intended to help those in the insurance industry um, who are looking to further their career by further study, um, but who may feel that because of COVID-19, their finances don't really allow them to fund those studies themselves. So we have um, a pot of money, and I'm assured that pot could grow. <laughs> uh, so anybody who um, is working in insurance or who has been in insurance and wants to do something to further their insurance um, or financial planning career uh, can go onto our website and they will find the application form uh, and the eligibility criteria, uh, which really are just, as I've said, working in insurance affected by COVID-19 uh, and, and can't fund the studies either from their own resources or via another uh, third party, such as their employer. Um, we're, we're very happy um, to receive an application at the moment from them because after all, if people are at home and have time on their hands and can use that usefully uh, to help their career in the industry, um, we're delighted to be able to support them uh, with this special initiative at the moment. That's great. And obviously, <laughs> Speaking about timeliness, one of the reasons why we wanted to do this webinar was really to help the industry be more aware and be more active in raising awareness about the work that the insurance charity is doing. And we have representatives from the insurance companies across the UK and Ireland today. So Joy, in just a few brief sentences or a few moments, could you explain or talk about how, if people do want to get involved in the work that they're doing, um, how could they do that and how could they raise awareness with their coworkers or, or with folks around them? Yeah, I mean, it's vitally important that we work together, both with employers uh, and with individuals, because often there may be a reluctance for people to come forward. So we need to encourage them that it's actually a very natural part of life. There will be times when all of us need support from somebody. Um, and if they work in the insurance industry, you know, they have this treasure trove, I'm quite happy to blow out our own trumpet here, a treasure trove which could support them and is freely available. You know, they don't have to have paid into it, their employer doesn't have to have paid into it. It is there uh, because of the generosity of people basically in the past who have given money for the benefit of insurance people. So what we'd really like to do is first of all ensure that we have that good partnership with employers. Um, so they can understand what we're doing and we can work together to support anybody um, who they come across who needs our help. So once they've done something, uh, 
whatever they can do in their own company, we can then take up the baton to support them the rest of the way. So that's the first thing. Uh, please, first of all, know what we're doing. Um, secondly, please engage with us. Uh, on Insurance Charities Awareness Week, whenever that happens, we have giveaways uh, which can be um, ordered from us and distributed to all your employees, uh, completely free of charge again, just so that our name is, is out there and people, think, even if they don't know what we do, they do know there is a charity that could support them. Um, we also now uh, have a dedicated marketing communications manager at the charity, something that we haven't, we didn't have before. Um, and, uh, you know, she is now well up to speed and waiting to hear from um, insurance employers who can just work with us. So you can tell us what it is that you uh, would find helpful to engage um, with your employees to tell them about what we do. And, you know, we can look at providing that for you. Uh, we, we do a small number of fundraising events, but really this isn't about money. This isn't about us getting your money. It's about us using your channels to get the money through to those people who need it. Yeah, that's such an important message. And we are going to hear from Victoria, our marketing communications uh, manager, in just a minute. But I did want to go back over to Dublin to Adriana and just give her the same question. How would you like to see folks uh, get in touch? What would you like to um, hear from folks that are on this call and, and how they're interacting with their folks? Oh, thank you, Josh. There are so many ways they can, they can interact with us. We have quarterly newsletters, which we'd be very happy to share. Uh, we're very active on social media, so please follow us and like us. Um, and if anybody is having your own fundraising events, <clears throat> we can offer flyers, posters or giveaways. Um, we're very happy to come and deliver in-company talks. And well, we can all do in-company talks again, but we can still do them on Zoom, the way we are today. Um, we can provide content for your own newsletters, uh, for your own intranet, line managers, some HR materials. We can uh, help with some induction material, with some retirement information. Um, and also, from time to time, we recruit for trustees and volunteers. So I'd really love um, if people could follow us, look at our newsletters, and perhaps when these openings become available to get interested and engage with us. But I'd really like, because we have everybody listening to us today, if you could let us know, please, by using the chat um, button, let us know what we can do for you. Um, and please get in touch with us even after today. And whatever resource you require, we'll do our very best to come in and help you at just so the insurance charities is to the forefront. So thanks. No, that's brilliant. And it's now time for our, our cute question and answer session. I know we've got just a bit of time for that, but before we do, I just wanted to quickly summarize some of the top points uh, from this section that we just finished. I think probably most important um, is for the folks on this call to think about anyone in your professional network that you know that is going through a difficult time. And we really encourage them to get in touch. And even if they're not certain that we can help, we may be able to connect them to somebody who can help, but we just want to make sure that folks are aware that we're here and we're honest and sincere about um, being as, as helpful as we can be, certainly during this incredibly challenging time. And secondly, we're really keen for line managers and human resource professionals and uh, corporate social responsibility teams to be aware of us and to understand how we can help uh, their staff as well. And we, we'd encourage you to share what you've learned today with those folks back at your offices. And finally, we would really like for you to keep in touch. So if anyone hasn't signed up for our newsletter or if you're not following us on social media, please do so. Uh, and also contact us through the website and get on our newsletter. So, so with that, I'm really pleased to hand the last five minutes or so over to some Q&A uh, with Victoria, who's gonna walk us through that. And Victoria is, uh, as you heard Joyce said, our communications and marketing manager, and she's just been awesome since joining the charity. So, Victoria, can you hear me? Is that okay? Hi, Josh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good stuff. Thank you for your nice comments. And thank you for everyone else's nice comments. There's some great comments here. Um, okay, so we've got a few questions. First of all, um, Joy or Adrienne, what opportunities might there be to get involved at a local level with the charity? Yeah, so, um, we work through the Chartered Insurance Institute and the Institute of Ireland, um, both in terms of communicating our message, making sure people know we're there, as well as um, visiting those people who apply for our help. 
and we are often looking for people to represent us people who have whichever skill set we just talked about um, just so that we get across our message well locally and and the the importance of this question I don't know who posed it was that actually local people know local needs best so we can think of something which we think has a global impact but actually you will know what's happening locally so you will know for example if the insurance industry locally is facing a challenging time a major employer perhaps is pulling out or there is an event that's happened locally which has meant the insurance industry um, has been significantly impacted um, there are lots of ways uh, it, you know local people are interested in local news and sometimes um, you know, they, they will be able to see what we're doing locally and that will bring other people along as well. So there are just absolutely loads of opportunities for people to get involved, I, I, again, on, on locally as well as nationally. But if, if you have time and if you um, are in an area, please contact us because uh, we would love to talk with you about whether uh, one of those perhaps um, areas of work would, would, uh, would suit you because but we need help and, and uh, you know as i mentioned before people come to us via the cab or some other referring agency we've got work still to do so uh, please please yeah. and i i'd say joe as well that we normally advertise any opportunities in our newsletters and on our website so if people are interested it's probably worth having a, a look and just checking out whether you know there's broad opportunities or volunteers okay we've got another question from sam have we seen an uplift in applications because of COVID-19? That's an interesting question. There have been quite a number of schemes whereby people initially thought, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? And when government funding has come on board, they've pulled back from their application to us. But there are still people who have slipped through the net or been impacted by it. Uh, so we have seen an uplift in the applications on that. What we always are aware of that when one area is focused on some people can fall back fall back from ap applying um, so in the same way that in the NHS people perhaps who have had a condition which isn't related to COVID-19 have been a little more concerned about coming forward because they think the focus is only on COVID-19 so we've really tried in the marketing that we've been getting across not just to focus on COVID-19 but in answer to the question not to be a politician yes we have seen an uplift in the, in the number of applications because of it and we are expecting a further uplift when temporary situations perhaps uh, crystallize into more permanent ones thank you joy i think we've probably got time for one more question if we just go over um, this is a question from paula uh, if i want to help someone but they are reluctant to engage with the charity can i apply on their behalf good question we would re whilst everything is treated in the strictest of confidence certainly we would be very happy for an introduction from a friend or a colleague what we would want to meet with and to ensure that the person that we would like to help or needs our help is engaged and wants our help that would be the important thing thank you adrian do you know what i think that's probably we've got time in terms of questions so i'm going to hand back to our host josh to finish off thank you Thank you, Victoria. And uh, just as a reminder, we are uh, recording uh, this session, and, and I believe the intention is that we post it uh, onto our website so that uh, so folks can go back and refer to it or even refer other folks to it as a source of information. Well, it just leaves with me to really say thank you all for joining us today in, in what is um, times for which none of us could have ever predicted. And I know as insurance professionals, we are all back to back in meetings and calls. And so the fact that you've made the opportunity to clear an hour of your diary to come hear about the insurance charities and how you might be able to help us um, is, is a massive gift. So thank you. Um, and thank you for, for being with us. I also want to thank our panelists, uh, Joy and Adriana, and also Amy for joining us and sharing their stories and shedding some light on what it is that the insurance charities do, does and has done for over 100 years. Um, and all that is to say is please keep the conversation going. Check into our website, do follow us on social media, get in touch with any questions that you have. We're really, really here to help. And with that, I just want to say thank you all and uh, enjoy the rest of this very sunny, very warm day here in London.